I'm Abhay Bhave. I'm a hematologist from Mumbai. We're going to discuss the management of transplant in eligible patients with multiple myeloma. Now let's compare these three. The baseline being MP and to that you add one of the three novel agents. Thalidomide and MPT, Bortezomib and VMP and Lenalidomide and MPR. Unfortunately, we have to note that none of them have been compared together in a randomized control trial as a head-to-head -head assessment of which is better. So how will I choose between these three protocols? Which novel agent should I add to the MP for the ineligible patients? I would go by some pointers. Renal function. Those who have had a renal dysfunction, I think bortezomib works very well and causes a faster reversal of the renal dysfunction. While lenalidomide has to be dose adjusted. Thalidomide again is also a brilliant drug that can be used in renal failure patients. If there is already a peripheral neuropathy because of, let's say, diabetes or any other reason, then I would prefer to avoid thalidomide or bortezomib because both can cause neuropathy. LEN is also associated with neuropathy, but lenalidomide probably has a lesser incidence. So maybe lenalidomide would be a good choice here. If there is a risk of thrombosis as per the standard ACCP guidelines, or there is already a thrombosis, then I would want to avoid thalidomide, lenalidomide. Bortezomib cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone which is called the VCD or the CVD or the cyborg dexa protocol works extremely well in such patients even in the elderly. If there are high risk cytogenetics then bortezomib seems to do very well and therefore I would choose a bortezomib based protocol for such patients. But then I want to know whether the caregiver can bring the patient in time, whether the patient can travel to me, whether the patient wants an oral drug and if so I might just use thalidomide or lenalidomide with dexa. Uh, and uh, melphalan. That will avoid the patient coming to me either for the bortezomib intravenous or subcutaneous form. Like we said that patients who have undergone a transplant go sub to some form of maintenance therapy. Is there any proven benefit for maintenance therapy for the transplant ineligible patients who have taken one of the protocols that you have chosen? So there is data that there is a proven benefit to use something to maintain the initial response. And we could use it for as long as possible, either till there is a relapse or there is intolerance of the drug. And all the three drugs that we have spoken about in the newer era, all can be used in this setting. However, may I point out that the salvage regimens come with some form of dysfunction. There is always some amount of difficulty or setback to the quality of life when you use these drugs for a long period of time, be it financial, be it scientific. And therefore, many of our patients have evinced the desire not to be on some form of therapy. That means they've asked me whether the patients can be off therapy and I've encouraged this, especially if the responses have been excellent. Because I know that maintenance therapy is associated with probably a relapse at some point of time. And therefore, if the patient is not keen to take it, I would want to give some treatment time off. Then the possibility of there being a second malignancy uh, in combinations also has to be kept in mind. Therefore, I would want to look at the benefits and the risks, discuss it with the patient, then decide whether the maintenance therapy can be, can be carried out for long. But there is robust data for at least the first one to two years of therapy if they can tolerate or if the disease comes back to use some form of maintenance therapy. This table shows you the phase three studies of the transplant ineligible patients. I'm not going to go through everything. I just want to bring to your notice something which I'd alluded to earlier. And that is about continuous therapy. RD has been approved, that is lenalidomide with dexamethasone low dose, has been approved for continuous therapy. And the data is robust. At the end of four years, in these 530-odd patients, it has shown at the end of 37 months follow-up that the CRHs are almost 15%, with the overall survival being near 60 percent. If you look at the other cohort of combination therapies where at least three or four drugs have been used followed by some form of maintenance therapy, again you'll notice that the patients are doing very well. The overall survival at the end of four years in all these three trials that are being shown to you in this box all are in the range of 60s and 62. But if you look at the two boxes RD is just oral therapy which is taken from home 
while the others need the patient to come to a facility where it can be given. That makes a major difference. And if the overall survival is similar, I think RD may in the future win hands down. Don't forget that there are supportive cares which need to be given to our patients. For the bones, bisphosphonates. Maybe initially for the first one or two years to be given as monthly and thereafter every three months. To prevent thrombosis, aspirin if it's a low risk or the combination of low molecular heparin or warfarin can be given for those who you think has a higher risk of getting a clot or there's already a clot. Prevention of infection because you know that the morbidity and mortality in multiple myeloma is related either to infections or bleeding. So prevention of PCP with cotrimoxazole, uh, giving vaccinations to prevent pneumococcal infections and H influenza are very important. One of the infection risks is hypogamma globulinemia and therefore looking at the IgG levels is very important in our patients, especially those who are getting recurrent infections and giving them immunoglobulin intravenously can make a tremendous difference to the outcome. Then there are other aspects which are called as related organ tissue injury because of the myeloma. So as related to the myeloma, we may get hypercalcemia which could add to the morbidity or mortality. These patients need good hydration, steroids and or calcitonin. If there's a renal insufficiency, see that you don't use NSAIDs for the pain that they have. You may need plasma pheresis. You may need high cut of dialysis if it's available or dialysis to see that you support the system till the time the kidney improves with the ongoing therapy. Anemia can be treated either with transfusions or you could give erythropoietin, darbopoietin, but remember there can be a risk of thrombosis with such patients and you have to take adequate precautions to prevent the same. If there are bony lesions, localized radiotherapy or if there is a vertebra which is about to collapse then a, a vertebroplasty might be of benefit to such patients while the therapy is on. If there is an impended com cord compression, nothing works as brilliant as radiotherapy. If there is already an existing peripheral neuropathy, correcting the vitamin B12 or giving something like gabapentin or pregabalin might help to reduce that so that your patient is able to take more treatment and go towards the standard of care. Hyperuric acidemia and tumor lysis are other things which need good hydration and associated allopurinol or febrixostat to bring it under control. So I think in transplant ineligible myeloma, what can I give you as a take home message? I think the most important is to counsel them about the disease and therapy. That it is treatable though incurable and there is a good chance that we might go to give a good quality of life. And if it's picked up early and treated well, then the chances of us doing well are in better. It has to be an individualized based therapy because frailty, comorbidities and personal beliefs will influence our decision of taking care of such patients. If the patient is truly ineligible, then Melphalan prednisolone as a backbone with one of the two or three new agents could be an excellent choice and we have discussed about the three protocols. However, if the patient has not made up his mind about transplant, then avoiding melphalan and using the other agents might be a very good choice. You can pick the novel agent combination based on the comorbidities and the disease burden that we have discussed earlier. Monitor the progress every two to four cycles to see how well your patient is doing and whether there is a response to the ongoing treatment. If not, a change in therapy would be mandated. Option of a treatment free interval is very attractive and must be discussed and taken in selected patients. However, for the large number of patients who desire to be on some form of therapy to prevent it coming back, continuous therapy in the form of lenalidomide and dexamethasone low dose has its benefits, although its side effects too, and that has been discussed and could be a very good option in many of the patients. We must remember that there are plenty of new drugs coming into the market for the treatment of multiple myeloma. However, the elderly patient and those who are frail have not been included in large numbers in these studies and therefore it's very hard to comment on them. So I'm hoping I've made a difference in your management of the transplant ineligible patients in multiple myeloma. Thank you for your attention. <music>